Well, welcome to this screencast on Dunn's A Valediction Forbidding Morning. And you notice straight away that we've represented this poem with a ma mathematical compass. Now, the reason we've done this is because this poem is probably most famous for its elaborate conceits. And, and the most famous conceit in the poem is the compass one, where he compares a compass to his, um, his love with his wife, Anne. But it's certainly not the only conceit in the poem. It's very complex, and uh, so let's get into it. Now, in terms of uh, the title of the poem, in contrast to the re to the poem itself, is actually uh, pretty straightforward, and very literal. So, a valediction. A valediction is a farewell. It's a speech, uh, a poem, a meaningful farewell. But this one is is a farewell that should not be mourned. There should be no sadness, no tears. This one is a, got to be a celebration. Even though Dunn is going away on to into Europe for a fair bit of time, leaving his wife and his family behind, they're not allowed to be sad. They, they should be celebrating what they have. And Dunn explains why. So it's very much an, this poem is very much an argument. Like many of Dunn's poems, he likes to argue a point. So we'll get started. The first stanza... Dunn asks us to jump into this analogy, which is that of a, uh, a man or several men in several rooms dying. So you can imagine uh, you know, a deathbed, a man's lying on it and his friends or family are standing around very sadly looking at him. So, but Dunn tries to, to tell us that this, these are men who have lived life to the full. They're virtuous men. They've been very good men. And because of that, they don't have any regrets and they pass mildly away. So they all die so meekly, so quietly, that their sad friends don't even know when they're dead. So the breath goes now and some say no. Um, so some someone says, oh, you know, is he dead yet? Someone says, no, I don't think so. I think he's still breathing. They pass so mildly that it's almost hard to know when the point of death is. So this is a very... So, uh, strange way to start a uh, a love poem, but uh, this is done. So uh, let's get on to it. So stanza two is related to stanza one, obviously. So the word so here lets us know this. So he gives us this analogy and then he explains it here. So let us melt. Now the word melt here refers very much to um, the movement of melting. So not really a, you know, a piece of butter bubbling away on a pan this is the idea that if you melt you move so slowly that gradually after a period of time there's nothing left and there's no, been no noise and no overt movement and so Dunn's asking for their goodbye to be like that without any fanfare and without any great sadness um, or, um, or tears and he says here Make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. He doesn't want any great demonstrations of emotion here because he says if we do that and we let everybody know, the laity, which is you know, the commoners, everybody around us, to a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. So if we let everybody know that I'm going and it's all sad, it would be a desecration, a defilement. It would cheapen us. We're above all this. We don't need to carry on about it. Our love is stronger than this, is what he's telling us. Just as these virtuous good men die so mildly because they don't have any regrets. They pass without any demonstration of emotion. Good. And then, so that's that first conceit. And then Dunn moves on to another one. Um, a very interesting one, actually. And he says... Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. So moving of the earth is an earthquake, and harms and fears are the obvious harms and fears that an earthquake would bring. Men reckon what it did and meant. So men understand earthquakes and they understand um, the damage and, uh, that they can, um, they can bring. But he says, but trepidation of the spheres, though greater, far, is innocent. Now, this is a strange one, but what it means is it's an allusion, of course, to this age of discovery where, um, you know, through the development of the telescope, 
people are able to look in the into the heavens and understand that um, there is a there's a great trepidation in the in the atmosphere. There's stars and movement of planets and and uh, asteroids and comets and and this is a far greater force going on up in the atmosphere, up in the uh, in the cosmos. But it doesn't because it's uh, so far away and because it's removed from the everyday um, from the everyday people then it seems innocent it seems as though it's no, not such a big deal so even though it's far greater than a mere earthly earthquake it doesn't affect the average people it it is what it is and it's it can it can live in in the cosmos without affecting the common man all right and then done it continues on by saying dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence so just like his love would be the enormous power of the cosmos and the love of the average person would be like an earthly earthquake you know, his love is greater because it's a love not of this world it's a love beyond the world and um, why do these lovers not cope with absence like he and Anne are going to be able to cope with because their love is sensory they cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it so in other words their love is very much associated with the physical that physical connection uh, and done saying look our love is greater than this we don't you know we we I'm sure he he um, he won't he won't deny the physical side of his relationship with his wife, but he's telling telling us and her that he doesn't need that. Neither of them need that to maintain their great love. Their love goes beyond it. It's a spiritual love. It can exist in absence, but other people, because their loves are not as grand, not as developed, not as spiritual can't admit absence they can't go away for long periods and stay in love with each other all right so very interesting uh, explanation of this elaborate conceit here of the difference between an earthly earthquake and a cosmic event far above the earth that's far more far greater in power but has very little impact on the average person all right so that is stanzas one through four. So let's go to five. But we by a love so much refined, and what he's doing is he's explaining, or he's going further than stanza four here. But we by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is. And so he's saying that our love is so refined, so developed, so spiritual, that it is even too much for us under, uh, to understand. This is where the metaphysical realm comes in. He's saying that that their love has even moved beyond their own comprehension. Inter assured of the mind, care less eyes, lips and hands to miss. So he's saying, because it's such a cerebral love, such a such a love of the mind and, and of the um, of the intellect, they don't need eyes, lips and hands. They can be happy just in that knowledge that they love each other. So Dunn continue, continues with his argument. Our two souls, therefore, which are one. Now, two souls cannot be one mathematically. But of course, this is one of Dunn's paradoxes, which he loves. He tends to love these paradoxes. So I would certainly note down that, that technique that he's used there. Two souls, therefore, which are one. And he uses this, of course, in Good Morrow where um, the two hemispheres become one sphere and therefore they're perfect, perfected. Um, and so the same idea exists here. Though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion. So he's arguing that don't think that something is broken because I'm not here. Think of our love as expanding. It has gone beyond what, what it is here and it will be even larger. The distance will make it even greater like gold to airy thinness beat so gold is a substance when you when you beat it and it can be um, it can be made enormous into gold film and um, gold plate and things like that 
So a small piece of gold can be spread out to cover a far greater, uh, greater area. So again, another conceit that gold spread over a wider area maintains um, its beauty and maintains its value. Good. So moving on, we're getting there. And honestly, there's been probably three or four conceits one after the other. Um, that Dunn uses to, to try and get his point across that don't be sad, it's fine, we're going to be wonderful because our love is greater than anybody else's and it will be even stronger because of the distance between us. Alright, so he carries on this paradox, if they be two, there are two, so as stiff twin compasses are two, so this two into one he explains with this famous compass conceit. So even though a compass, let's have a look up the top, has two feet, it's joined at the top into one. This is what he's referring to. So if they be two, there are two, so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, so Anne is the fixed foot, she's the, she's the one who stays in the house and she stays in the centre of the circle makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. So the leg in the middle of the compass turns when the, um, the outside leg of the compass creates the circle. So therefore, whatever he does, she will work in tandem with him, but obviously over a wide distance. So it's a, it's a, lovely, it's a lovely metaphor, a lovely conceit, where even though there's distance between them, they are still joined. And he continues, and though it in the centre sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as that comes home. So in other words, he extends that metaphor to say that, you know, the centre foot moves as the, as the outside foot of the compass moves. Uh, it, mo it leans and, and reacts as the outside leg of the compass changes its its uh, distance and so forth, and as the outside leg um, comes towards it, just as Dung, Dung is coming home, both legs end up straightening up and joining together. So this word erect, I mean Dunn's famous for his sexual illusions, but I think in this situation, um, I don't think we should read too much into that. I think. Um, I think it is as it is. I don't. I think we should take that literally without the double meaning, because it's referring to his wife. And then he gives her praise now for her steadfastness, and and tells her that such steadfastness is what keeps him um, keeps him strong and just. So he, such wilt thou be to me, who must like the other foot obliquely run. So he's saying. You will be the compass for me. You will be the bearing. You will be the person who's holding me to the circle. Um, and he says, Thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I begun. So he's saying her position as his wife, her love, her steadfastness in holding the home together keeps him just, keeps him from straying and it will bring him home again. It's what, it's what gives his life meaning and it will bring him back to where he, be, where he belongs. So it's a really lovely metaphor um, that Dunn uses to finish off here. Um, and so we've got you know, the conceit of the old men, um, we've got the conceit of the trepidation of the spheres, we've got the conceit of the gold, um, and then we've got the conceit of the paradox of the two souls becoming one, and then he expands that into the into the compass, how the two twin legs of the compass are joined and so become one. So very elaborate poem, conceit after conceit, but you've got to we've got to understand that this is a poem where Dunn is arguing his point. Obviously, his wife is probably not particularly happy about him heading off to Europe for a holiday and leaving her behind with all the kids, and. Um, and he's trying to argue his case. He's saying, look, don't worry about this. It's fine. We're, our love is going to be even greater because of the distance. Um, so have no fear. And I'll be coming home. And 
because you're here and keeping things together, it's going to keep me just and true and I'll be back before you know it. So it's it's a very, when you look at it in those terms, it's such a natural and human response to, to going away. It's the sort of argument anyone would use um, if they had to leave their, their family behind for a period of time. All right, so that is valediction for bidding morning. Thank you very much.